All right, Ninja Jerks, what we're gonna do in this video is we're gonna talk about growth hormone. So growth hormone, we discussed a little bit about, um, we haven't really got to the complete detail of it yet, but we know specifically in the hypothalamus, there's some specific hormones that are being made, right? So for example, if we look here in the hypothalamus, here's the hypothalamus, and the hypothalamus has a specific nucleus situated in there that's actually releasing this really, really, really potent and powerful hormone, and this hormone is called growth hormone releasing hormone. And if you remember, what was the growth hormone releasing hormone do, uh, doing? It was actually circulating through the hypophyseal portal system, which is this circulatory vascular connection between the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary, or we can call it the adenal hypothesis, right? So it circulates down through the primary capillary plexus, through the uh, intermediate hypophyseal portal vein, and then out through the secondary capillary plexus, and then what? It'll stimulate what? What's this actual green cell right here called? What is this green cell here called? This green cell here is actually called a somatotrope. Somatotrope. A somatotrope, when it responds to the growth hormone releasing hormone, will secrete out into the bloodstream this very, very, very important hormone that we're going to spend most of our time here talking about, and that is growth hormone. So this is actually growth hormone. Now, real quick, GHRH, because it's actually being released, what's some of the secondary triggers that can cause GHRH to be released? So what are some other things here that are causing this actual release? So you know growth hormone, it's actually stimulated by a couple different things. Let's actually note them. So let's say here, let's actually number them. So let's say what's stimulating it. So let's say here in this, these actual black column, we're gonna say the things that are stimulating it. So one of the stimuli is actually going to be, um, we could actually say high amino acid levels in the blood, in the blood. That's one. And I'll explain why that's a strong stimulus. Another stimulus here is actually going to be low glucose levels in the blood, okay? So we could say hypoglycemia, right? That's another word for this low glucose in the blood. Another stimulus is low fatty acid levels in the blood, okay? So low fatty acids in the blood. Another very, very potent stimulus of the growth hormone is going to be exercise. That's a huge one. Exercise is a very strong stimulus. And even we can say certain types of healthy stressors, right? So certain types of healthy stressors, okay? Because not all stress is a bad thing. So certain types of healthy stressors. Okay, these things right here could be the very driving force to start causing this growth hormone releasing hormone. How? They could be utilizing this mechanism by what? Stimulating this nucleus here, which we haven't even said what this nucleus is. This nucleus is a very, very potent nucleus, and it's actually releasing other hormones besides growth hormone releasing hormone. So that's why it's important to know what are the primary stimuli um, and these triggers that can actually cause growth hormone release. Well, the actual nucleus here is actually called the arcuate nucleus. It's called the arcuate nucleus, okay? So this nucleus right here is called the arcuate nucleus. And again, what's stimulating it? High amino acid levels in the blood, hypoglycemia, hypolipidemia, exercise, and certain types of healthy stressors. And it's causing GHRH release, which is stimulating the somatotropes to produce GH. Okay, now what's the function of GH? Well, growth hormone is actually gonna have a specific organ, a target organ that it's gonna to go to first, okay? So some of it will actually come to this target organ, some of it will actually go into the bloodstream. So let's show it bifurcating. So it's like, I'm gonna go this way, and then the other way it can actually go, and it can actually bind right into this receptor right here. So let's say it binds into this receptor right here. So let's say here's the growth hormone, we'll draw it as a actual green circle here. Let's say it's this green circle and it binds on to this receptor. And actually, this is a uh, specific type of receptor. Um, it actually is gonna activate a, like, kind of like a tyrosine kinase receptor. It's kind of like a tyrosine kinase receptor. And what it does is, there's a specific part, whenever growth hormone binds onto this receptor, it activates this phosphorylation of specific types of amino acids 
on this inner part of this receptor. And what it does is there's this, this enzyme that's activated here, and it's called Jonas kinase, but we just actually denote it as JAK. So Jonas kinase is Jack, and he's the one that's undergoing this phosphorylation, right? And when Jack causes this phosphorylation, another thing that he can do is he can phosphorylate this uh, specific type of uh, transcription factor. And that transcription factor is actually called STAT. So here we got Jack. This Jack is activated. And what does Jack do? So let's see here, we, we square, we, we kind of show this as STAT. Jack actually come over, comes over here as a jaundice kinase, and he can add phosphates onto STAT. What does STAT stand for? It stands for Signal Transducer Activator of Transcription. So what do you think he's going to do? He's going to come in here, and he's going to bind onto a specific sequence of DNA, a gene sequence of DNA, right? And when he binds onto the specific gene sequence, it's going to undergo transcription and it's gonna produce, what, mRNA. Then after the mRNA, it'll actually go to a, what, a ribosome, and then that ribosome will do what with the protein? I mean, with the actual mRNA. It'll translate the mRNA. When it translates the mRNA, it actually gets converted into a protein. And then it can go through multiple different types of other processes. So again, what is this right here? This is our protein and it'll undergo some modifications in the rough ER and the Golgi, but eventually it'll be pushed out into the circulation. What is this protein that we actually secreted? This protein is actually going to be called insulin-like growth factor. So we got insulin-like growth factor type one. Okay, so it's making insulin-like growth factor type one. Okay, why am I mentioning this? Because I showed you here, right, growth hormone's kind of making a little detour here. So let's say, you know, he's, he's, he has this little fork in the road here. So what's this fork in the road, right? So he has a little fork in the road. And he's, some of him is actually gonna go this way. So a certain percentage of him is actually gonna go into the bloodstream and go exert its effects on target organs. Some percentage of him is actually gonna go over here on the liver and activate what's called this jack stat pathway to lead to the production of insulin-like growth factors. Okay, what's gonna happen now? So let's say here we have our growth hormone. Let's focus on the effects of insulin-like growth factor first. Okay, insulin-like growth factor can do a lot of different things. Okay, one of the big things he's gonna do is, he's actually gonna go and promote a lot of protein synthesis. How? So you see this muscle cell right here? What he's gonna do is, he's gonna come out here, he's gonna come out of the bloodstream, so let's say he, here he comes out of the bloodstream, and he comes over here, and he binds onto this receptor right here. So let's actually draw him as, um, let's draw him as green again. Let's say he's the green molecule, right? So let's say here we have insulin-like growth factor one. He binds onto this receptor present on the muscle cells, our skeletal muscle, right? What does he do? he activates specific signaling pathways. So he'll activate specific signaling pathways, and let's say inside here, the muscle cell, here's the actual nucleus. It activates specific genes and produces specific types of proteins. And what are these proteins gonna do? These proteins are gonna come over here and maybe phosphorylate or do some specific type of mechanisms to these channels right here, these green channels. Guess what these green channels are for? They're for amino acids. What do we say was really high in the blood in order for the stimulus to occur? We said that there was elevated levels of amino acids. Well, what are we gonna do with these amino acids? Well, growth hormone is stimulating what? He's stimulating these channels to open, and guess who these channels are specific for? Amino acids. And guess what's gonna happen with these amino acids? They're gonna get taken into this muscle cell. Another thing that's gonna do is, this isn't the only pathway it can stimulate, it can stimulate another pathway. It's gonna stimulate another pathway here, which is it's gonna take these amino acids and it's gonna convert these amino acids and cause them to get linked up. And when it links up a lot of these amino acids, it's gonna link these amino acids together and produce what's called proteins. So what are we gonna get out of this? We're also gonna get proteins. And what kind of proteins? Could be many, many different types of proteins. 
It might be proteins that are gonna be like myofibrils, like actin and myosin and other different types of uh, cytoskeletal proteins. And what is that gonna do to the overall size of the muscle? It's gonna increase the muscle size, right? So what's the overall result of this? The increased amino acid uptake and increased protein synthesis can lead to increased muscle size, right? So it might lead to hypertrophy of the muscles. So it's gonna increase the overall muscle size and muscle function. That's, that's a beautiful thing there. Okay, so it's gonna stimulate amino acid uptake and increase protein synthesis, which can increase the muscle size and function. That's one thing that this guy can do. What's another thing they can do? So let's say that I take a look here at the bone. So let's say insulin-like growth factor comes over here also, okay? So insulin-like growth factor also decides, okay, I'm gonna come through this way also. So I'm gonna come through here and I'm gonna exert my effects on some specific parts of the bone. All right, so what was this insulin-like growth factor doing? It was coming over here, and on the bone, you know you have a bunch of different cells within the bone. What are these cells that we're gonna focus on specifically in the bone? There's gonna be what's called osteoblasts and osteoclasts. What this actual growth, I'm sorry, this insulin-like growth factor is gonna do is, it's gonna be able to work to regulate the activity of these two cells. So what it's actually gonna do is, it's gonna be weird, it's actually gonna increase the activity of both of these cells. So it's gonna increase osteoblastic activity, and it's gonna increase osteoclastic activity. So it's gonna increase bone deposition and bone resorption, and what's the overall result? It's gonna play a very, very crucial role within bone growth. But it also, we could actually even be more specific within the bone. Not only does it increase osteoblastic activity and increase osteoclastic activity, is it plays a very, very important role with what's called endochondral ossification. Okay, so it plays a very, very important role with endo chondral ossification. So one of the things that you're gonna see out of this is that there's gonna be an increase in like the bone mass, right? So the bone's gonna be a little bit thicker, it's gonna be bigger, you're gonna have this in, uh, increased endochondral ossification process. Another thing that it's gonna do, what's other components of the bone? It's also gonna stimulate protein synthesis. What is it gonna stimulate the protein synthesis of? What's the type of collagen that's present inside of our bone? Collagen type one. Okay, so you can actually have a lot of collagen type one in here. So let's say here, we can actually put here in red, we're gonna have a lot of collagen production. And again, what type of collagen is actually being produced here? Collagen type one. So we're gonna be producing a lot of collagen type one. So that's gonna increase. Okay, so that's that part. So what's the process of bone uh, working on the bone? It's gonna increase the collagen type one. It's gonna increase osteoblastic activity, it's gonna increase osteoclastic activity, but they're gonna be highly regulated, which is gonna enhance the endochondral ossification response. What's another thing that this is actually gonna do? There's not just that proteins, you know there's other things? There's what's called proteoglycans. So it's gonna increase the production of what's called proteoglycans, and these are also extremely important in bone also, okay? So let's just remember that overall, in the bone, what's the overall effect in the bone? It's gonna increase the overall production of type one collagen, increase proteoglycans, highly regulate and increase the activity of both of your osteoclasts and osteoblasts to where they can enhance the endochondral ossification response. Okay, wow. Now what about its effect on the cartilage? Because it also has effect on cartilage too. So if we were to look at the effects on cartilage, let's actually look at it right here. So this is actually a piece of cartilage here. But what we're actually looking at, let me actually draw another piece of bone here. Okay, let's say here, again, we have the bone. And then what part of the bone are we looking at specifically for this part here? We're looking at the, what is this part here? This is called the epiphyseal plates, right? So this is your epiphyseal plates. Okay, because you have your diaphysis, and then you have your epiphyses, and this is the epiphyseal plate here on the ends. What is this insulin-like growth factor doing here? Insulin-like growth factor one is also acting on this right here. What is it doing here? You know what's actually gonna be some of the main cells inside of this is actually cartilage here. You're gonna have a lot of chondrocytes. So you're gonna have a lot of chondrocytes. Guess what this actual insulin-like growth factor is gonna be doing to these chondrocytes? It's gonna be increasing the differentiation, the size, the hypertrophy, proliferation of all of these chondrocytes. So what is it doing? It's increasing the, 
Let's actually write this down. What is it doing? It's increasing the differentiation. Okay. It's increasing the size. Okay. And it's, in, it's causing increase in proliferation. Why are we doing this? Because you know what's called interstitial growth? You have what's called interstitial growth of the bone, right? Where it's increasing it in length. Because you have appositional, which is increasing in width, and you have interstitial, which is increasing in length. What growth hormone is doing is it's causing these actual chondrocytes, or chondroblasts really, to start proliferating, right? So they start proliferating. Well, actually, they get bigger in size, they hypertrophy. All right, so they get bigger in size, they start proliferating excessively, and then what happens is these layers, let's say here's this is this is the part of the bone down here. Let's say down here is the bone, and up here is a part of the bone, right? What's gonna happen is there's actually gonna be osteoblasts which are gonna be chasing this cartilage, right? So as we continue to keep proliferating these guys and getting them bigger and bigger and hypertrophying and stuff like that, down here is where they're differentiating. So this is actually gonna get turned into bone, into bone, into bone, into bone. So what is it helping the actual bone to do? To increase in length. So it enhances the interstitial growth, right? At the epiphyseal plates. So it's increasing the actual chondroblast uh, proliferation, their hypertrophy, they're increasing in size, and also it's causing them to differentiate into certain types of bone tissue. Okay, so what do we have here for cartilage? It's increasing interstitial growth. What is it doing for bone? It's increasing the osteoblastic activity, osteoclastic activity, which is enhancing the endochondral ossification response. It's making more proteins like collagen type one, more proteoglycans, which is being able to increase the actual density of the bone and helping to have more thick bones, right? And then what else is it doing here in the muscle? It's increasing amino acid uptake into the muscle cells and it's activating genes to uh, tr uh, trigger the protein synthesis process. Okay, now that we've done that, we've looked at the effects of insulin-like growth factor one. It's causing a lot of effects specifically on the bones, the muscles, and the cartilage. Now, it also does have some extra skeletal effects, but let's look at growth hormone real quick. You know growth hormone, he loves to act on the liver, so he also has other, you know, not only does he actually work through this pathway to stimulate the production of insulin like growth factor one, but you know he also can act, let's actually show it over here here. This is also gonna act to be able to do some specific process. What is this process that he's also gonna stimulate here? He can also stimulate what's called gluco, neogenesis. What's the overall effect of gluconeogenesis? It helps to be able to increase the blood glucose levels. How are you making this glucose? From non-carbohydrate sources. Where's those non-carbohydrate sources coming from? Let's just track this growth hormone all the way over here to the adipose tissue. So this is our adipose tissue right here, right? This is the adipose. What this growth hormone is gonna do is it's gonna bind on to these receptors here, right? So here's a receptor here, here's a receptor here. What's it gonna do? It's gonna trigger this intracellular mechanism, right? Activating an enzyme called hormone-sensitive lipase. What's that hormone-sensitive lipase gonna do? The hormone-sensitive lipase is going to act as that cutter that we talked about, right? It's gonna start breaking down what? This actual triglycerides. When it starts breaking down these triglycerides here, it's gonna break down the triglycerides into two components. What are those two components? One of the components is actually gonna be glycerol. What's the other component that we're actually gonna make out of it? Fatty acids, right? So we're making two components out of this. What's that glycerol actually gonna be good for? It's actually gonna be good for the process of gluconeogenesis. We've actually used that in order to make glucose. So that's one of the things that growth hormone can do, is it can come over here, act on adipose tissue, and increase this process right here, which is called, what is this process called when you break down triglycerides into glycerol and fatty acids? It's called lipolysis, right? Then what happens? The breakdown products of lipolysis like glycerol can actually be used in the liver to make glucose. That's called gluconeogenesis, right? We said before that odd chain fatty acids, sometimes odd chain fatty acids can, some of them can also get converted into glucose uh, to, for gluconeogenesis, but we're, like we're saying here, we're going to stick primarily with talking about uh, specifically just the glycerol for this case. But just if you want to know for your own personal interest, yes, odd chain fatty acids can be converted into glucose.
but this is the mechanism that we're going to talk about. So again, glycerol to glucose via gluconeogenesis is one of the effects of growth hormone. Lipolysis is, lipolysis is an effect of growth hormone also. Okay, and growth hormone can also activate amino acid uptake also. So we could also say here, if we show with this blue representing the growth hormone, he could also act on that receptor to increase the amino acid uptake into the muscle cells. Okay, so now that we've done that, let's just go over really quickly here on this board, what's the overall effects of growth hormone and what's the overall effects of insulin-like growth factor? Insulin-like growth factor one, and then growth hormone. Let's write down their effects real quick. So he was doing what? He was stimulating the muscles, right? So he was acting on the muscles, he was acting on the bones, he was acting on the cartilage. He can also do certain types of metabolic functions as well, but we're gonna stick to this. What was he doing in the muscles? He was working to be able to do what? Increase amino acid uptake, and he also increased protein synthesis, right? So he's helping with the muscle growth, right? So the muscle hypertrophy and the muscle growth. What is it doing for the bones? Doing a lot of stuff, right? Increasing osteo, I'm gonna put OB for osteoblastic activity. It was also increasing osteoclastic activity. It was increasing collagen type one production. Okay, so collagen type one. You know how you can actually remember how collagen type one is actually the main collagen in the bone? Well, you know how you spell bone? B-O-N-E, look, one, okay? So collagen type one is the type of collagen in the bone. Okay, so collagen type one. Another thing is actually going to be, besides collagen type one, we also said it could be increased proteoglycans, right? So a lot of stuff like that. And then the increase in osteoblastic and osteoclastic activity assisted in what's called endochondral ossification. Okay, we're gonna put growth hormone, obviously, to the left now. <laughs> All right, now, we talk about cartilage. What is it gonna do for cartilage? We already said for cartilage, it was gonna increase the proliferation, right? So it's gonna increase the proliferation of the uh, chondroblasts, of the chondroblasts. It was gonna increase the size of the chondroblasts. We said that it was also gonna increase the differentiation, right? So in other words, the chondroblasts would be converted into specifically um, it would actually be converted, the cartilage the tissue would eventually be converted into bone tissue. So cartilage would eventually get converted into bone tissue. So differentiation of cartilage, like we'll say the chondrocytes or the chondroblasts, right? So the chondroblasts. So eventually this would actually lead into bone tissue, right? And what's the overall result of this? An overall result was an increase in the interstitial growth. Inter Stitial growth, which increases the length of the bone. So we could say with this was increase the length of bone. All right. What did we say was the effect of growth hormone? We said the effect of growth hormone was on the liver, and it was on the adipose, and it was also on the muscles. What is it doing? It's working on the liver to be able to increase what's called gluconeogenesis. It's also working on the liver to increase the insulin-like growth factor, one production. It's also going to act on the adipose tissue, and when it works on the adipose tissue, it enhances what's called lipolysis. And it's also going to work on the muscle tissue, and in the muscle tissue, it's going to help to be able to do increased amino acid uptake.